guest should be familiar to us all. He had the, the biggest selling album that anybody had ever seen in, in, in the 80s. So, so relax, it's Holly Johnson. <laughs> Hello, Neil, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, you have a new album, so let's just start there with Europa, because you, it's been a while since we've heard any music from you, so why? Uh, well, it yes, it's been a very long gestation period for this album. Um, in 1999, I released uh, uh, Soul Stream on my own label. And uh, that was a very exhausting experience, uh, in actual fact. I'd never sort of run, run a label before and or produced an album myself before completely. And... Uh, after that experience, I really felt the need to do something else and express some other um, type of aspect of my creativity. So uh, in a sort of attempt to reboot that, I went back to art college, okay. which is something I was just about to do in 1983 when uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood sort of exploded uh, with the release of Relax, right. they which certainly you did kindly explode. mentioned <laughs> um, earlier. So I did that. I went to the Royal College of Art, wow. kind of via uh, meeting Sir Peter Blake, who uh, I've always been a big fan of. The He's great British, British pop artist. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I remember as a child um, pouring over the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band record sleeve, uh, and it was a kind of, you know, technical portal into which I entered pop music in many ways. Mm. And uh, he created that with Jan Howarth, his uh, girlfriend at the time, I, I believe. Um, and he, he's, you know, that visual and musical uh, masterpiece, I suppose you could call it, uh, kind of formed my interest in pop music, I suppose. I was living in 1960s uh, Liverpool, right. just around the corner from Penny Lane, where, you know, the song on the radio was all about. And But there was something very black and white about the Beatles, and this was somehow technical and trippy, I suppose. I didn't understand that concept. No, you wouldn't then. have been old enough to trip then. No, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, I did kind of trip a bit later when I went to see 2001 Space Odyssey, of course, which yeah. David Bowie made uh, a sort of side swipe at musically um, with his first hit. Uh, but all, all those sort of things came to a point in... 2000 when I met Peter Blake who'd seen an exhibition of mine and he invited me to uh, exhibit at the Royal Academy of Art uh, summer show that he was curating and uh, I met him and Eileen Cooper who was also an artist and printmaker and academician and she invited me to the Royal College of Art to work alongside the MA students and I enjoyed that so much that I ended up staying four years. Right. See, I told you I could talk. Yeah, so the, you you re <laughs> you know you re dived into that those kind of artistic origins. Let's 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 look back at the the very artistic origins. So you were what an art student around the time of punk rock. Well, I was someone who hung around oh. the art school bar <laughs> with art students, and okay. my flatmates were art students. And um, in the late seventies, uh, especially in Liverpool. Uh, art and music were combined in the form of a band called Deaf School. Yeah, I remember Deaf School. And they... Deaf School won the Battle of the Bands and uh, the Melody Maker and were on the front cover. So as a 13 or 14 year old who subscribed to the NME and the Melody Maker, it was uh, amazing to see that there was actually a band in Liverpool formed in the art school that um, were, were living and breathing in, in Liverpool and they weren't this sort of monolithic Beatles thing that had happened in some sort of 1960s uh, orgasmic daydream uh, and had disappeared and flown the coop. This was a real thing happening, if you know what I mean. And art college seemed to be uh, instrumental in lots of musical things, you know, um, Obviously, John Lennon, uh, etc. Uh, but Deaf School were an amazing band, really. They were kind of a, 
a sort of cabaret, uh, um, rock, pop. They had lots of different elements to it. They had a bit of Roxy music in there and, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't much David Bowie in there which was the first concert I went to see in Liverpool in 1973. Um, but there was certainly some Roxy there, uh, mm. which was the second concert I went to see. Right. So that's coming out of, of Glam. And, and, and some members of Desco went on to be big producers and, and very involved. So your first band that we notice you in is Big in Japan. Well, in fact, that was... Def School were very instrumental. Yeah, in, yeah, because in some of the same people involved, yeah. Uh, a sort of another art college dropout, uh, Bill Drummond, um, helped form Big in Japan. And with... Bill went on to all kinds of things, managing Teardrop Explodes and, and Echo and the Bunny Men, and then doing his own. Uh, what was his? I've no idea. He... You've no <laughs> idea? No, I've no idea. My, my memories are of. Um, being in Big in Japan with him right. and getting on the 86 bus. And for me, he was an old man. I was 16 <laughs> and he was 26 with a wife. And I'd go and pick him up because he lived just sort of across Smithtown Road and we'd get the 86 bus into town. And uh, he'd sort of been in, you know, the art college and... Uh, the theatre world, building sets, and uh, for, a, I think, a play called The Illuminati or yes. something that happened in Liverpool, Ken Campbell's theatre company, etc. Uh, but really, when you're 16 and you're too cool for school, literally, uh, that's how you think of yourself. Really, this guy was over. <laughs> <laughs> 26 is absolutely ancient, so, you know... I would sit with him on the bus and then go and, you know, learn the songs to be the bass player in, in this sort of new wave post-punk combo, uh, I suppose you could call it, with Ian Brody, who was a bit older than me, playing guitar, and Budgie playing drums. So Ian Brody went on to the Lightning Season, Budgie went on to Susie, Susie and the uh, Banshees. Via the Slits. Uh, via the Slits. Which is quite important to remember. And wasn't, uh, there was a couple of people who have gone on to producing in there. Who else was in? Well, Clive Langer, Clive would, Langer. you know, was instrumental yeah. in the formation of uh, and uh, Big in Japan. And we used to use Deaf School's equipment and we used to rehearse in Eric's club and we were, in a sense, the, the house band. And there was a single released on the Eric's label, which was... I suppose it, what you'd call an indie label nowadays, you would call it, um, called Big in Japan, which I didn't perform on, in fact. Uh, but I did go on to record for the Eric's label a couple of solo singles when I was about 18, af after the Big in Japan thing had folded, and we'd done Peel sessions, etc., and almost signed to Jet Records, and <laughs> thankfully didn't. Uh, and was that the dream? Uh, was the dream of pop stardom or was it something art, rock, creative? Well, it was definitely... I was definitely drawn into the uh, Andy Warhol ethos of pop and the Velvet Underground. Obviously, it was David Bowie who drew everybody's attention to that uh, by his kind of, in a sense, aping of the Velvet Underground sonically with Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, that sort of fictitious band. Um, and I was sort of drawn in by the David Bailey film that he made, which was very controversial. I think in the late 60s it was shown on television. And uh, it was on the front of my mum and dad's newspaper, The Daily Mirror. This should not be shown on television. And this sense of Andy Warhol and controversy and uh, alternative sexuality came into the mix. Um, and this was all very appealing. And it, uh, it was also art and music combined, which uh, always turned me on, really. And my guest is the great Holly Johnson, who is about to tell us about uh, one of the great pop phenomenon moments of British world history. Am I? Yes, because <laughs> what happened? It, it, it seemed like one minute, uh, you know, there's a band called, uh, with a ludicrous name, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, singing, 
you know, some bizarre, intense song about uh, gay sex. And it was... Well, well that's sudden, debatable. Well, then, we'll, <laughs> we'll discuss that. And then suddenly it was the phenomenon of... It was like the biggest record of the of the times and the biggest band of it. its moment. It's very bright and brief, a brief moment to tell. So Frankie Goes to Hollywood certainly didn't start out as a, as a pop band. Uh, no, I have to sort of wind back the clock a right. little bit just to explain the genesis of yeah. Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Uh, after um, releasing a couple of solo singles on the Eric's label, uh, I sort of... Uh, all the my um, peers had all joined bands like Teardrop Explodes and Echo and the Bunny Men and were off touring. And uh, so I really had to search amongst a slightly younger generation uh, of Liverpool musician, the sort of kid that went to the Eric's matinee. Eric's was an amazing nightclub that we all sort of went to and saw Blondie, Talking Heads, Jane County, etc. cetera, uh, in that late 70s era. So it took me quite a few years to find, you know, young musicians because I knew I needed a band. Being a solo artist, just wasn't happening for me and uh, it, it just wasn't the flavor of the day you had to be in a band and have a a, a sort of ideology and a, a gang-like uh, visual image uh, I, I was very aware of that so really Frankie Goes to Hollywood was a kind of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars for me a sort of something I thought about, had a a decided uh, uh, artistic vision about mm. and um, sort of formed and created. Um, and, you know, we're doing shows around the North West wherever uh, I could. Um, we were almost, you know, about to call it a day and I was about to go to art college, as I mentioned before, um, because it didn't seem to be happening. We'd... Do we did a video and uh, that we our manager then Bob Johnson took around record labels and they thought we were a bit too hot to handle in terms of the visual presentation. Uh, girls in the uh, record company offices would be ushered out while <laughs> the men watched the video, for example. And this was the times we were living in. Yes. In uh, the early 80s, uh, you know, the very whiff of homosexuality also wasn't really welcomed. Uh, you know, at, at a time when Boy George and um, Mark Almond were having hits, but not actually being able to say that they were gay. Although they it said it in different out. ways. They said it in different ways, but, you know, the yeah. official record company line... It uh, was not that, you know, Mark Holman was gay and Boy George was gay. It, it just wasn't spoken about. So it was very difficult for us to get a record deal. Uh, there were only two people who showed any interest. Uh, Beggar's Banquet, who offered us 40 quid a week, which was, you know, a princely sum oh, to us at that the time day. when we were all, or most of us, signing on yeah. and getting about 23 50 and surviving on that. Uh, and then there was ZTT, this sort of uh, production company, let's call it, uh, rather than a record label, who had a deal with Island Records. Island Records, of course, was something to revere, as was, um, at the time, Trevor Horn's production abilities. He'd been made fashionable by Malcolm McLaren and his involvement uh, with him for that particular album, uh, Buffalo, Buffalo Girls. Girls. In fact, um, I don't think I would have been interested in Trevor Horn from just his involvement in Dollar and the Buggles. Although those were such big, glossy, oh, amazing pop productions. There's, that, there's no doubt about it. They were amazing. Um, Handheld in Black and White is a great mm. record. I did own the seven inch as a sort of guilty pleasure. Yeah, it was a guilty pleasure. But of I mine. wouldn't brag about it. <laughs> uh, I, they know. were deeply uncool. It was definitely Malcolm McLaren that sort of did it for Trevor, in my view, right. anyway. Or oh, for someone of my generation.
you went with Trevor. Yeah, for no uh, money. For no money. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, it was a good call. <laughs> The, the, the single that he made with you, Relax, comes out of the trap. So it, it was an amazing sounding record. Did you know when you made it, this is something different, this is going to... Well, well I knew when I wrote the song right. two years previously, it was something different and a, like catchy, like an STD. You know, I really <laughs> knew that there was something in this song that had a potential. Uh, the same with Two Tribes, uh, you know, I, I knew that, and from the reaction of people, it's just getting the record deal was the difficult bit, really. And uh, and also working with Trevor, Trevor was difficult because he was such a perfectionist. Mm. And this was going to be the first record on his sort of imaginary record label. He took three months recording it, scrapping version after version, and... Uh, it was finally finally released in October 1983. It hung around for three months. Uh, we, you know, made a video and performed several times on the tube. The tube were highly instrumental in breaking Frankie Goes to Hollywood. From the time when they first came to Liverpool to film us before we had a record deal and. Uh, you know, showcasing us several times uh, at the studio up in Tyne Tees. And finally in January, because someone dropped out, we got a slot on Top of the Pops and uh, the BBC started playing the track. And uh, the, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> there was a little bit of a fracas on the radio and uh, it went from number six to number two and then to number one anything and they just put little bleeps and, and, and stuff but um this the idea was I, I i actually never said well this is a gay sex record to me it was a sex record it, it didn't you know you don't have to be gay yeah no there's a male ejaculation <laughs> in the right in the it. middle of relax uh, and it, it, we'd heard the female orgasm on record or a faux version of it from Donna Summer and Jane Birkin in Je Tem, uh, but there had never been that quite that sort of <laughs> visceral uh, male orgasm happening on record, uh, which, you know, happens both musically and uh, vocally, uh, etc. Mm. There was definitely something going on <laughs> in the grooves of that seven inch and 12 inch vinyl. So then, then you know the, the the phenomenon that occurred. Nobody could have prepared you for that, or or, or expected that. No, it was totally unexpected. Even uh, I know the record company put their hands up and said, "Aren't we marvelous? We've manipulated <laughs> this situation immediately and tried to grab all the kudos uh, from the band." In fact, which they were quite successful in doing, uh, but really. It, it, there wasn't some uh, genius master plan behind it. It just happened, really. Well, what was it like to live through? H hectic. You know, from one minute, literally, of living in Liverpool, uh, signing on every fortnight, even during the recording of Relax, uh, to, you know, flying to Germany, uh, Berlin, um, Brussels... Paris, doing TV shows, um, you know, it was a very different life suddenly to the one I'd experienced in Liverpool, which was in living in Toxteth with riots on the doorstep and riot police parked right outside the flat I lived in. And so it was quite a contrasting world suddenly that I was transported into. Did you enjoy it? Uh, I enjoyed some aspects of it, de definitely. And uh, w with that kind of arrogance of youth, youth that you have, uh, you become, uh, you have a sort of mindset, oh, yes, this is my divine right. <laughs> you know, and you do become uh, this other person. And I defy anyone not to be affected by sudden pop stardom. Uh, you know, it is deeply affecting for good and for bad, you know, in terms of your personality, especially when you're that young. Uh, I, I was 24, but some of the members of the band 
weren't even 21 yet, I, I think. And you're watching Needle Time with my guest, Holly Johnson. Um, Frankie Goes to Hollywood made a double album that's one of the defining albums of the 80s. I, I, I don't think production has ever got bigger. It's, it's an absolutely monumental sort of record, but there's also great big songs in there. Um, it had a, you know, one song covering, spanning a whole side. It produced a bunch of hits, the amazing Two Tribes and, 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 a, and a fantastic ballad. Um, did you, was that difficult to make? Because I know Trevor Horn, as you say, is a perfectionist and there's a lot has gone into that. Or was it just the record you'd been trying to make your whole life? And... Uh, no, it wasn't the record I was trying to make my whole life, in actual fact. And the fact that it was a double album was a, a double-edged sword in many ways. Um, they wanted to do something that no one had ever done before. And I don't think a debut album had ever been a double album. Uh, before, and I think it was a, unnecessarily a double album, uh, it, from my view. And we were kind of forced to do um, quite a few cover versions that I had no interest in, in doing, really. And we'd certainly had enough songs for a single album. Uh, but there was something about the excess of the 1980s and something about... Um, the sonic quality of vinyl and it was almost two 12 inch records rather than two actual albums in in one sense because the 12 inch record became a big part of the whole frankie um thing machine uh i think for the first time um one song was remixed multiple times in different ways and that had never really occurred before. Maybe there'd been one extended 12 inch or one special mix of, by Patrick Cowley of Donna Summer's I Feel Love, for example. Uh, but uh, remixing a track five or eight times um, and bringing them out week by week or um, to extend the life mm. of that particular chart run, that had never been done before. Now, of course, it's something that happens automatically in in the, in the music industry. So there were, there were lots of things about Welcome to the Pleasure Dome and the uh, the four singles that came from it that hadn't been done before. In fact, in fact, you know, um, your biggest hit really was the was the simplest and purest song, "The Power of Love," which was done. You know, with almost with a very delicate air, where the so it's the song that's pushed to the fore. Yeah, well, it, it, what, it's been a big hit by virtue of the time it was released. It was never intended as a Christmas song, and while we were at touring in America, uh, a video was made of um, the nativity for the power of love. Uh, it certainly didn't stay at number one for as long as Two Tribes, which was a nine-week run, uh, during which Relax re-entered the charts and uh, s stuck at number two, which hadn't happened since uh, The Beatles or The Year Dot or whatever. Uh, the Power of Love is a strange phenomenon and has kind of got a life of its own now uh, by virtue of it being played every Christmas. Uh, but it, it's not about Christmas. Um, and it, as you say, it is a very simple pion to love, rather than being a love song. Different to the kind of full-on onslaught that, that Frankie presented. It's, it's, all, it's almost sentimental, it's not quite sentimental, but you know, it's a very sweet, old-fashioned sort of song, really. It, it is that in many ways, and uh, I set about writing about love uh, as a subject and wrote lots of lyrics about love in a great big ledger that my dad had given me um, in sort of, you know, fountain pen, which was the way I, I used to write lyrics at that time. Um, it, I, I wasn't really consciously thinking, let's sort of, um, you know, side swipe them here with a, a different take on the world. Uh, it, it was just something I felt 
um, I wanted to do. I think it was initially inspired by Label Mates The Art of Noise right. track, Moments in Love. I think that's where I got the idea from, perhaps. And it was first recorded for a John Peel session at the end of 1983, was it, I think? And then, uh, you know, finally the souped up, 60-piece orchestra version was released in the following November when it was number one. Now, as quickly as Frankie were everywhere at once, it, it, it fell apart. You had one more album and then it was, it was gone. You fell out with Trevor. You had to sue for your freedom from the label. and Well, no, he sued me, I actually, I have to say. Right, he sued you. So <laughs> you fell out with Trevor. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Uh, fell apart, which made it a very short-lived phenomenon. Did, did you do you regret that it was such a short-lived thing, or do you think that was that's that that's to its benefit now? Uh, I, I think it's to its benefit. I had to get out. It was it was destroying my health. It was. I think Liverpool was one album too many in a sense. <laughs> it it should have imploded uh, earlier, uh, like a supernova, which it kind of was in a sense. It, it was um, it was about to suck me into the black hole uh, backdraft of you know the explosion, and I ran for my life basically. <laughs> you did uh, have some solo success then in the early nineties, and it, it was. It, Something different, it was kind of fresher disco music or, you know, dance, pop music. It, it didn't have all the overtones. No, I had a massive tax bill <laughs> and a number one album to uh, pay it off, which was great. Uh, you know, having a, a, a debut number one album in 1989, I felt slightly vindicated because... A lot of mud had been slung at me from ZTT, uh, saying, oh, this person can't sing, this person blah, blah, you know, so it was great to have that. And you're watching Needle Time with my guest, Holly Johnson. So off the back of all this success in the 90s, you uh, revealed that you were HIV positive. Now, obviously, that's a lifetime struggle. At the time, it was... Uh, probably a lot more scary because it was coming out of, you know, the AIDS decade when so many people died. Um, has it been... How has it been living with living with this? Uh, well, I, I had friends um, as early as 1984 who uh, died as a result of uh, HIV infection. And, uh, you know, slowly I lost my whole sort of extended gay family right. uh, throughout the 80s and, and early 90s. Uh, there, there wasn't actually a test for HIV, a proper certified test until 1986. And if you did uh, have that test, it prohibited you from life insurance and it prohibited you from getting a mortgage and lots of things like that. So a lot of us didn't even have the test because we wanted life insurance and, you know, to buy a house or whatever. Uh, it, it got sort of closer and closer and closer to me, uh, you know, friends who I shared a flat with, friends who used to be my boyfriend and things like that. So I, I knew deep down that there was a, 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 you know, a big possibility that I was affected. And... Uh, when I was officially diagnosed in October 1991, it was actually an AIDS diagnosis. It wasn't just you are HIV positive. Um, they said, oh, yeah, you know, you, you do have AIDS. You have AIDS defining conditions. And, um, you know, I started to put my house in order, really, and do the things that people do when they know their time is short. In actual fact, so it was very difficult uh, at the time. I also knew that I would have to, at some point, deal with um, the press on the issue because I knew that they would have an interest uh, from the very first counselling session. Um, the so-called counsellor or contact tracer said to me, oh, I know what the press are going to say. And uh, that was quite disturbing in itself, you know, having to think about uh, not just taking on board 
that you had what was then thought of as a terminal condition that you would have to interface with the press about it you know that that I wasn't looking forward to that particularly but but here you are and um, a lot of work and uh, has gone you've, you've you've put out records you've you've done your painting you've done your your art you're living with the disease if it is, that's what I uh, well I don't think of it as living with the disease in, in actual yeah. fact any longer I, I think for 10 years uh, when I struggled to say stay alive and was looked after by my partner Wolfgang who's also my manager of 30 years now um, I, I now, it, it's now regarded as a chronic manageable illness and uh, which is which is amazing, really. Uh, so, yeah, I have somehow survived through that. And surprisingly, I'm still here and I'm very grateful for that. And experiencing something like that uh, definitely shows you what your priorities should be in life. And it's not necessarily to have a glittering career or um, it's to, you know, it's to fulfil your dreams and the things you want to do in life and to enjoy that as much as you possibly can. Uh, so I've learned a great deal from that yeah. experience. So after a long period doing art and, and, uh, and stepping away from music, you've stepped back in. What made you feel that you wanted to step back in? Uh, well, it was a gradual process after Soul Stream and the exhaustion of that. Um, you know, I wanted to do something else and creatively and... But I never stopped going to see concerts or listening to music or playing with my acoustic guitar at home and writing the odd song. It was always part of the fabric of my life. And even when I was painting, I was listening to very loud music. It, it, it was always a big part of me. Um, but, you know, the spotlight had definitely moved somewhere else. Uh, and, uh, you know, I accepted that. that th this, these things happen. You go in and out of fashion and people's consciousness. Uh, I think in 2009, there was a, a TV advertisement, uh, uh, a 25th anniversary of a well-known airline, used Relax as a backing track in an 80s-style advert. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing that it could be a, a TV ad theme it, after, it, at the time, they it, wanted to ban it? Absolutely, but the vocal was removed, <laughs> and it was just the instrumental, right. uh, in fact. So suddenly, in 2009, I existed again as a, a recording artist mm. by virtue of, of that happening. Uh, so slowly I started performing again at various festivals uh, during the summer, uh, one of which I think features on Vintage TV, the Rewind Festival, yes. which is amazing fun, I have to say, to perform at. Um, I just did one, the new Rewind North, two weekends ago, or last weekend, that was great. Uh, so I, I realised after performing again that really stop all this shilly shallying. This is actually what you are meant to be doing because, you know, it, it was just so enjoyable to do. And uh, I, I gradually and quite organically met Mark Ralph, who had been working with some people I knew, the two bears, and um, we met and I took some songs to him and started working in his studio in uh, Queen's Park. Right. You know, it's it's dance music that you're making, but you talk about it's writing on the all. acoustic guitar and, and, and even you've said you play the piano very badly. So well, what's the process? Well, I play songwriter's piano, <laughs> let's say. Um, yeah, no, I always really write songs on an acoustic guitar. That was the first instrument that... Um, I wanted because, you know, Mark Bolan played acoustic guitar and David Bowie played the 12 string acoustic guitar. It is a very, um, well, for people of my generation, it was the entry level instrument into music. I also do think if you can't play a song with an acoustic guitar, it isn't really a great song in, in some senses. 
Uh, it is an important instrument for the working class and, you know, the history of pop music. Um, so, yeah, that's how songs are written, with chords and or on the keyboard. Yeah, I, when you say it's dance music I make, it's not strictly dance music. It's always been a kind of hybrid of electronic and real instruments. But it's, it, it's beat-driven. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I feel obliged to uh, aid people in the dancing. I think dancing is just as important as singing and uh, enjoyment in life. I think all these things are important. Why did you call it Europa? Uh, well, Europa is the title track, really, and it was uh, in a oh, homage to Vangelis, who um, it, there's a very long story about the genesis of uh, the track Europa. It started off in 1990 in a bunker in the Bois de Boulogne uh, in Paris, where Vangelis was living in the Plaza Athenay Hotel opposite Marlene Dietrich's apartment. And this bunker that he took me to was earmarked for Adolf Hitler's usage during the uh, occupation in, in Paris. Roman Polanski turns up with Emmanuel Seigneur and says, I'm going to be in the video. <laughs> and uh, it was a sort of bizarre sort of weekend uh, where this sort of scouse kid from uh, Wavertree was transported into this kind of, I don't know, how you would describe it, film music world. Mm -hmm. um, so the song started like that in 1990, but wasn't actually completed until about eight weeks ago. Uh, again in Paris, in a different studio, uh, with, with Van Gallis uh, again playing his Blade Runner-esque uh, synthesizer yeah. over the top. It all comes around. It does. Well, Holly, thank you for coming on Needle Time. <laughs> Sorry, it's good to have you talking back. Talking the leg off you. It's all right. That's what we're here for. It's good to have you back in music. And uh, Holly Johnson. <laughs>